few weeks ago, we started a brand new series called Lose the Snooze. Has anybody on a Monday morning when the alarm gone off thought about this series? Has anybody been challenged? Um, I, I usually uh, start my Sunday mornings very early and uh, my alarm went off really, really early this morning. And uh, I've got a subtle alarm. I've got a, a watch I wear on my arm that vibrates to wake me up in the morning so I can wake up and it doesn't disturb the rest of the home. Um, and it doesn't have a snooze button on it. Isn't that great? You get one chance, just one shot at it. But I've got to be honest, I'm, it vibrates on my arm this morning and I think it's time to get up. It's still dark outside, it's time to get up. And I think, just a few more minutes. And I think, Mark, you're speaking on Lose the Snooze. <laughs> just stop it. Just, you need to get up. And I'm just thinking, I could just lie here a few more minutes. No, Mark, you need to get up to prepare your subject on Lose the Snooze and to pray. So, um, this series is a challenge to all of us, but not just the snooze of our sleep, but the slumber of our days and the slumber of our lives and the slumber particularly of our spiritual walk. Yeah. That if we're not careful, we snooze through life, missing the opportunity, believing that a better moment and a better time will come. And of course, it doesn't come. We get one choice. We get one opportunity of this life. We get one time on this earth to make a difference. And this is your time. Don't hit the snooze button. This week, I want to look particularly at awaken your yes and your no. Your yes and your no is incredibly important. No two words will shape your life and your day more than yes or no. Yes and no are the bounces on the doorway of your life. Your yes and your no's decide what comes in and what stays out. Your yes and your no determines what's in your life. God made your life to have boundaries. He has declared that your life is to be stewarded and looked after. That your life is to be a life of wise choices and decisions. Of responses to things that God has entrusted to you. And your yes and your no decide whether you allow that which God has put in you to flourish and grow or to be crushed and die. Yeah. Yes or no is really important. I think they're some of the most important words that we can articulate. Say after me, would you? Yes. yes. That was nice, wasn't it? Turn to the person next to you and say no. That was a bit harder, eh? A bit harder. Some of you, that was the first time you've said that word for a long time. But both of them are powerful tools in our hands. If you become sharper at using the tool of yes, there will be an inadequacy in your life if you don't know how to use the tool of no. Yes and no are really, really important. When I was growing up, in fact, we still sometimes play it as family games. It's one of those games you can even play around the dinner table. The game, yes, no. Anybody know the game? So you have to ask someone questions. And they can answer with anything except the words yes or no. It's a great game. And you sort of lull someone into a false sense of security because they start out thinking, I'm not going to say yes or no. I'm not. And you can see the concentration. And they use maybe, possibly, not sure, they use any description they possibly can to give a response to the question they're being asked. And eventually you see them lull into this moment of just where they've concentration has slipped and they say, yes, you go, got you. It's a great moment. It's a great game. So often in our lives, the enemy of our lives is trying to stop us from saying yes, no. And our lives get full of maybes, possiblys, don't knows. But if you have a purpose over your life, which I believe you have, 
if your life was designed for destiny, which I believe it was, if you have been called by name, which I believe you have, then I don't believe your life is to be a life of possibilities or maybes, it's to be a life of yes or no. It's to be a life that stewards your life. This is not a game. The consequences of the enemy getting us into a, a maybe mode in our life, it's not a moment he goes, ha ha, got you. It's got you. The stakes are far higher than a simple game. The stakes can make a difference between not just your destiny, but by you stepping into your destiny on this earth, you unlock the destinies of others yeah. on this earth. So it's not just you learning the yes and no's for the sake of your life, it's learning the yes and no's so you can be a steward to impact the lives of others also. Snooze is a place of compromise between the yes and the no. Let's look at a simple verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. It says this, all of you, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. We go back previously, we see the context of this, do not swear by heaven or earth or your head, you can't make your one hair white or black, it doesn't really have a an allowance for bald people in there, unfortunately. <laughs> but basically, the bottom line is this. Your yes and your no's are important. And they should be firm, resolute decisions in your life. How many of you remember when you were born? You were there. Parents probably remember it. I don't remember when I was born, but I remember when my three kids were born. Beautiful moments. The indentations of nails in my hand have just about disappeared after all these years. It's a beautiful moment. But when our, when our babies, when, when babies are born into this world, when you were born, you didn't have the capacity to say yes or no. You don't know. You, you are, in fact, your parents or whoever's looking after you at those early stages of your life, part of the call and the purpose of their life is to protect you and is to make the yes or no decisions for you. That's what they do. So they keep away things that are harmful and they introduce things that are good and wholesome and helpful to you. They're a foundational stage in someone's life. Do you remember your first words? Remember mum saying, please say mum, mum. And dad's going, please say da, 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 da. And this six month old, he looks at you and says, no. I don't know if your first words were yes or no, but they probably followed fairly soon after your first words. Because children very quickly learn to develop that sense of independence, that sense of, I'm now going to decide what my yes and no's are. But of course, they don't have the knowledge that you and I, I have. They don't realize when you say no, don't put your hand near that fire. They don't have the capacity to understand why it's harmful to them. So even though they've learned to say yes or no, they don't have the full wisdom to be able to make those good judgment calls in their life. And so a parent is allowing their personality to be nurtured and developed, but there's still a protectiveness around them to help them shape their yes or no's. But as you get older, you're supposed to become independent on those things. You're supposed to become wiser in terms of the things you say yes to and the things you say no to. You're developed to be that way. Parents don't position themselves with their kids that I, for the rest of my days as a parent, are going to say the yes and the no for my kids. If you do that, parents, you are controlling. And you're not fulfilling the purpose that God has for you because he's designed your parenting to release the kids into a place of flourishing, not just independence, but dependence on God. 
that they know how to sound their yes and their no's and to make those decisions with wisdom. We're designed to release our kids through a journey. The problem is this, that so often we immaturely develop in these areas. And there are some reasons for that. Some here might be aware that there were times when you should have been protected and you weren't. There were times when others should have said the appropriate yes and the appropriate no, and they didn't. And you were hurt. And you were violated. Somebody has crossed the boundaries of your life and you end up feeling abandoned or lost, lonely. And as a result of that, you've learned some lessons about yes and no's that come from a place of fear, not from a place of love. God wants to heal those. Yeah. I believe the gospel makes provision to heal those things. One of the Jesus mandates as he stood up and he announced his public ministry was, I've come to bind up the brokenhearted. Amen. He's not just interested in your attendance at church, he's interested in your heart, yeah. your feelings, your emotions. He wants to fix, restore, repair. I don't know if you've ever seen this moment, but you're shopping around a supermarket and there's a, there's a parent who has a toddler in the trolley, on the seat in the trolley, screaming. If you've never had kids, your thoughts are, why doesn't that mother shut that kid up? I was on a flight a couple of years ago and there was two parents with a young toddler and this toddler was screaming the entire flight. You could see some people getting agitated. Because I'm a parent, I was feeling sorry for the parents. Because I knew they were trying to navigate some disciplines with their kids, but also trying to deal with the pressure from lots of other people on the plane to silence their child. It's a horrible scenario. And the kid is screaming, I want it now, now. Give me my yes, give it to me. And the child becomes more stubborn Particularly when you try to get them out of the trolley and they lock their legs. <laughs> I'm not coming out of this trolley. Who taught them that? Which night school were they whiff, whipped off to to learn how to do that? Out and the whole trolley is lifting with them <laughs> as you pull them by the arms. You're going home whether you like it or not, I'm going to take the trolley into the car if I have to. And eventually, the parent, under a sense of pressure, gives in and says, oh, have the lolly. Just have it. And the kid, beaming with a smile, that's all I wanted, mum, just the lolly. Just give me the lolly. The thing is, later in life, it's not just a lolly. And if we don't emotionally develop from that, our response to the world around us is to crave the acceptance of our wants and our desires, and we will do anything to get it. And God didn't design you that way. God designed you to mature, to become a man or a woman flourishing in your ability to say yes and no. You are designed to grow up. 1 Corinthians 13, which often gets read in weddings in verse 11, says this, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. We're supposed to put away childish things. We're supposed to lay down those things that are undeveloped, under emotionally developed. We're meant to deal with them to grow and to mature. Church, whatever age you are, learning the wisdom of God in your yes and your no's is part of your growing up. And I want to look at four areas that you and I are called to steward in our yes and no's and unpack these together. First area I want to look at in terms of our stewardship is who we are. 
We're called to decide the yes and no's based on who God has made us to be. We could do a forensic examination of every single life here. We could do a strengths profile. We could look at character preferences. We could look at emotional development. We could look at physical features. And we would conclude this thing, that no one is the same. No one. In fact, we could multiply that process out around the world and find that there are no two people identical. Even the closest we have of an identical twin, they're not identical. They are unique and individual. And God has designed that purposefully because you have a unique contribution to this world. And you might have spent your life interpreting that in a negative way, but it's not designed as a negative way. It is designed as a positive. It's designed that you, through stewarding who we are, will make a difference for the good in this world. That means you've got individual strengths profiles about your life. You know, I have to look at times at the things that God has put into my life and the things that he hasn't and base some of my yeses and nos on whether it fits with who God has made me to be. We have all too often in this world people living a plastic life trying to keep up with other people that they admire. We've got an Instagram culture where... Does anybody have a bad day on Instagram? Anybody? Oh, this is me looking depressed. This is me having an argument with my wife. Smile, wife. This is my, this is my dinner that someone's just made for me, and it's horrible. We never have any of those moments. Everything's so beautiful and wonderful and great. But we know they've just selected the choice moment. They filtered it, literally. They filtered their lives to present the good things. But the thing is, you follow their lives and you think, oh, I wish I had a life like they have. It never seems to go wrong for them. Look at them smiling, eating ice creams by the seaside. I just had a blazing row with my wife. Why can't I have their life? And we begin to make comparisons that are unfair and are not true. And God has called you to steward your life. You can't steward other people's. Even as a parent, you start off stewarding, but you to release them, you have to steward your life. And I find that so often when people steward their lives incorrectly, they begin to blame other people. And you're responsible for you. You are responsible for who you are. Your yes and your no's for your own life are important. There's a story in Genesis 32, reading in verse 22 onwards, that tells us of Jacob. You know, Jacob, this incredibly important biblical character, was a bit of a ragamuffin, really. In fact, the name Jacob means deceiver. Imagine your child being born, you look at them, you say, God, give me a word for them. I want to, I want to give them a name that fits their personality, that fits the unique destiny on their life. God says, deceiver. <laughs> That's not an Instagram moment. That was his name. And Jacob had deceived his father, manipulated his brother out of a birthright blessing, Manipulated him out of a blessing for his life. And many years later, was about to see his brother who he had deceived. And he organized that his family and his wealth would be split into two. So that if his brother was aggressive and went for him, that at least he would still have half of his possessions tucked away somewhere. So even at this point of about to be reunited with his brother after all these years... He's still trying to wheel and deal. And he goes to sleep. 
And we read that an angel, it was God that showed up and wrestled all night with Jacob. It's not what you sort of expect. Come to the front, God wants to touch your life. And it looks more like WWF at the front. God is getting you on the floor and what are you doing, God? I'm just having an encounter with Jacob. <laughs> we read that it actually hurt. God touched Jacob, injured his hip, spent the rest of his days with the repercussion of that. In fact, the Jewish diet avoids some parts of eating from certain parts of the body as a result of just an honor of this moment in this story. But Jacob's, Jacob's body may have suffered the moment of that encounter, that wrestling with God, but his faith changed. And God said, you're no longer going to be called Jacob, deceiver. You're going to be called Israel. And the next day, when he meets his brother Esau, it's a different man to the one who would have met him 24 hours previously. Because an encounter with God changed his life. See, God changes us. He, you may be mindful in your life that the past that you've experienced, good or bad, has given you an identity. It's given you something of shame over your life. But Jesus, when he touches our life, when he meets with us, he gives us a new identity in Christ. We're no longer the same people we were. We don't tend to change our names, but we could because we are a new person. The old has gone, the new has come. But who we are, the say and the yes and the no's. Jacob should have said no in some occasions. He said yes, and there were times he should have said yes where he'd said no, but God met with him and changed it. You might look at the lack of wisdom in your life as to who you are, but God can change it. If you will open your life to him, it can be different from this moment moving forward. Secondly, what we do. We're called to be stewards of yes or no's in what we do. Our activities. Are you busy? In fact, is there anybody in this room not busy? I don't know anybody who's sort of thinking, oh, I just, nothing to do. I don't know what to do. If you are, come and see us. Most people, they're busy. I know some people who are really, 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 really busy. And sometimes I've seen the grace on their life when someone says to them, I'm busy. And they say, really, what's going on? And they tell them about something they did that week and the person who's really, 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 really busy thinks, that doesn't sound very busy. <laughs> so we're all different, we're all unique. We all have different capacities to how we do things. I read lots. I think probably in the last four or five weeks I've read about six, seven books. I, that's me, it's not you. I remember when I was a younger minister looking at some older ministers that, and they used to talk about getting up early in the morning. And I think, oh, I'm really bad, I can't do that. And I just realized that they were just a bit older than me and now I can't sleep so well. <laughs> different stages of life. We're all unique and we're all different. But it's really important to understand that what we do, that saying the yes and the no's are decisions that honor God. What we do, how we respond with the activities of our day and our lives, that the yes and the no's become the gateways to whether what we do is right or what we do is wrong. Whether what we do is good or whether what we do is bad. Whether what we do is constructive and destiny-laced or whether it's destructive and robbing of our future. What we do. I find this really important. One of the temperature gauges, you know what a temperature gauge does? Remember those old glass thermometers? None of these digital ones you got today. Remember the glass ones you put under the tongue? There's always a taste, wasn't there, of that? I'm not sure if my mum washed it between me and my brother using it and all that stuff. But put it under your tongue and you sit there with this thing sticking out of your mouth for a few seconds and they pull it out and they would look at just this mercury that had gone inside and say, okay, it's normal. Well, the temperature gauge of your activity, I believe, is your joy. 
Let me explain what I mean. That there are times, recent weeks, recent months, when I've approached people who are doing lots of things in the church, and I've said, tell me about your joy. Because if they are buzzing with joy in their life for what they're doing, I think that's good. But if they're beginning to get a little bit crotchety with others, if they're beginning to be resentful, a little bit of the Martha Mary syndrome, look at me doing all this work, what are they doing? They're not doing anything compared to me. If you're losing your joy, something needs to change. And I'm not responsible for your joy. You are. And you need to revisit your yes and your no's. Yeah. This might surprise you, but I've sat down with some people in recent weeks and said, you're doing too much for the church. Shouldn't do that, should I? <laughs> Tell you why. Because I've noticed their joy is slipping. And joy in serving Jesus is important. I love what I do. I love what I do because it's who God has called me to be and I'm doing what he's called me to do. If I lose sight of those things and begin to say yes and no's in wrong places, my joy begins to slip. Jesus said, my burden is easy, my load is light. And don't get me wrong, I'm really busy. There's loads going on. Just think about the growth in this church over the last few years and the rise of ministries. There's loads taking place in the church and there are loads of other people really busy in the church. Busyness is not always a good thermometer. In fact, fruitfulness is a better thermometer in terms of your time than busyness is. But you should retain your joy. If you're losing your joy, something has slipped and something has gone. I've been facing adverse circumstances. I've been facing criticism. I've been facing all sorts of difficulty. But the joy of the Lord has been my strength. And the joy of the Lord can be your strength in what you do. But I want to look at something else with our activities. And to do this, I'm going to invite a brilliant elder and worship leader, Andrew Davis, to come and join me on the stage. Would you give him a big welcome? Because Andrew and I had a conversation just the other week, particularly about distractions. Do you remember that conversation? I, I hope do, so. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I do. So, Andrew, in terms of you know, busyness and activity and life and distractions, just tell us some of the thoughts that you had around some of those things. What, what triggered this for me is Mark sent an email out to, um, to a few of us saying, uh, we did this series on busyness and distraction. And I was sitting, I travel quite a lot for work, and I was sitting on the train going up to London. And this guy got on next to me, and he sat down. He was suited and booted, ready to go to his job in London. Sat down next to me, you know, it was early in the morning, it was probably kind of 6.30 in the morning, sat down. And I looked over, and he'd open up his phone. And this guy, clearly a, you know, high-flying professional who was on his way to an important job somewhere, had opened up some fantasy fighting app, some game and proceeded for the next two hours and 15 minutes until we hit Paddington to play this game. And I looked over and I thought, what is it that that's the choice he's made this morning? What is it that this guy who's got on next to me? And, and instantly, I guess, my also question was to myself, you know, why do I dig into some of those things um, that are around me that are so easy to be distractions that take me away from my core purpose? Um, so that's for me where I started thinking about this. And I think that there are many reasons why we get distracted. You know, we've got lots of good excuses. We've, we've actually got more chance to be distracted, I believe, than ever before because we've got the ability to choose. If you've got 100 pounds in your bank account, you could have woken up this morning and gone pretty much anywhere in Europe. You've got geographic choices. You've got informational choices. Almost the entire world's information is stored up online for you to access and choose to go and read whatever you want, to learn whatever you want. We've got entertainment choices. I don't know how many channels you've got on your your TV at home, but regardless of your TV, you can just jump online and find pretty much every bit of programming that's ever been made there free to view. Um, and so there's all those good reasons about why we might get distracted. But I think beyond all of that, there's some matters of the heart that we've got to deal with. 
And I know for me, you know, it's easy to blame these things. It's easy to say that the smartest minds in the world are currently being, you know, focused on creating more distractions for me, whether it's in Silicon Valley creating the new hit game or whether it's uh, somewhere in the world creating the new Facebook. There's, there's, there's all these good reasons. But actually, so, so, Andrew, just pick up on that. Do you think that there are some people sitting in rooms saying, how do we take their time and attention? Absolutely. absolutely. So software is my industry, and I, I, it's, I find it really interesting when I come across people like this. Because whether, whether it is gaming, there are, there are people, the brightest minds out of the best universities are being hired into companies with the fundamental goal of distracting you. That's, that's what their day job is about, that's what their KPI is, that's what their PhD research has been done in. A when PhD in how to distract people, <laughs> wow. When, when you play that game, moving those blocks around, you know there's someone on the other side who's built an al algorithm that makes sure that when, you're getting, when it's getting a little bit too hard, it makes it a little bit easier for you, so you're going to stay engaged. And actually, when you know, it becomes a bit easy for you, it increases the levels, so actually it's going to become harder to keep you at that point of engagement but not disinterest. So absolutely, take, take advertising, a whole other industry where the whole purpose of that industry is to create a hole in your life so that they can then sell something to fill it. Again, the brightest minds, the best creativity in the world is being placed into 30-second spots in order to create dissatisfaction in you. And so I think those are all really good reasons. Um, you know, social media is another one, right? There are whole growth teams, you know, hundreds of people working at these big social networks whose fundamental goal is to make sure you spend more minutes of every waking moment of your day consuming content on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And that's their, their goal, you know, teams and teams of people. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that could be morally neutral if you want to, but in your life you've got a choice, and in my life I've got to choose as to whether, how, how I respond to that. Um, but I think most fundamentally, those things are digging at a me question. What is it about me? Um, and that's the question, I guess, I think we should all ask ourselves. Because when we go and open up that game and play for two hours, ten minutes on the way, in, way into London, um, what, is it? What, is, what is it? What vulnerability is it in me? What need to impose control over some set of circumstances such that there's a direct line between what I do in that game and the reward I get from it, the leveling up? You know, I think a lot of games are around us escaping into a world which we can control rather than the one we're in right now, which we actually can't control. Um, so the question is, well, why is that hole in me? What sense of disease, what sense of, of lack of peace is there in me that I'm then looking to fill by all of these different types of distractions that are around me? Um, so I think there's a deeper why that's, that's more about meaning, because there, there are real world um, and spiritual problems there that we're actually filling with artificial solutions. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how the, the science behind these things does understand the condition of our heart and our psychology to be able to try and grab hooks into us. You know, there's a need. If you're posting on Facebook and you keep checking to see how many likes you've had for your post or your picture, there's, that's because there's a need there for acceptance, a need to be loved, a need to be valued, and it's never going to be met by, you could get all the likes of everybody on Facebook and it's still not going to meet that need. It's only Jesus can really unpack and meet that need and he wants to. And the distraction stops us from going to Jesus to find the answer because of the artificial stuff that's in the way. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely, I think the, the, it's an easy choice to put that salve on it. I know in myself, when I'm in my most um, distracted, concerned state, when I, I feel like things are shifting around me, stuff's not good at work, stuff's not good at home, that's the point at which I should be going out, getting alone, actually confronting my own thoughts, working through those, having some alone time, and yet the easiest thing in the world is to press next on Netflix. Or well, the easiest thing in the world is to find yet another game that's going to keep me, you know, keep me at peace in myself for another 30 minutes or so. Um, and I think we had to have to add wisdom into those decisions. You know, this is not a, um, a critique or a criticism of every minute that we spend on something that's not productive. Um, it's saying that we should, we should have to add some wisdom into those decisions. Yeah, it's great. Andrew, I wonder if we could all just ask Andrew to lead us in a prayer. And I wonder if you could participate in this prayer in a really simple way that if you recognize that you're distracted because of the, some of those heart conditions, some of those things that Jesus wants to meet, that you will instead take your gaze off your tablet or off your phone or off whatever it is. It might be a friendship group you're a part of. It's not all about online stuff. That the distractions that are conspired against you to take your attention from God, that you would know a healing and a release and a boldness to 
give the appropriate yes and no in your life. Would you mind praying for us, Andrew? Let's pray together. Father, your word says that we should fix our eyes on things that are above. And so, Father, we ask for the wisdom to do that in every moment of our day. We ask for the wisdom to understand what it is in ourselves that is causing some of those reactions and those decisions and those distractions. Father, we want to be people who are real before you and real before those you have placed us in community with. So, Father, we thank you for that wisdom to make decisions that are based on you and your story and your future that you have for us. Yes. Rather than based on any need for meaning or need for connection or need for entertainment or need for time to pass. Father, help us treat what you've given us in terms of time and in terms of resources with such precious stewardship. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Let's express our gratitude to Andrew. Thank you for sharing that, Andrew. Great insights. Isn't it amazing to think there's a conspiracy against us? It's little wonder it's not easy following Jesus in every area of our lives. Or am I alone? Am I the only person who finds it not easy? I don't think so. I think all of us find it really tough. Doesn't deny that God's real, doesn't deny that his power is not at work in our lives. But we are in a battle. And the ability that we have to hit snooze is all too prevalent. Thirdly, so we looked at who we are, the yes and no's, the second D, what we do. Thirdly, the where we're going. I have to use vision as my filter for some of the yes and no's about my life. There have been times when I've been invited to participate in some trip to another part of the world, or to be involved in some ministry or get involved in something that's good, that's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a fantastic initiative. But in my considerations, I've weighed it up and I've considered that I have to say no here because I recognize that I would be filling my life with stuff that's not in line with the trajectory that God has for me. And we have to do that. We are stewarding our time. If you don't know what your purpose is on this earth, now... This can be quite an intimidating thing to say, so let me unpack it a little bit. There are some people in this room who will naturally be visionaries and will have a go-getter mentality about them. And they will you ask them, we've just been listening to a car, uh, to, to, not to a car, it's sad, isn't it? Ooh, listen to that car. <laughs> we've been listening to an audiobook in the car as we've been traveling of a, of a, a Canadian astronaut who I think at the age of eight decided that he wasn't going to make any decision in his life that counted against the potential of him becoming an astronaut one day. Since eight. Every decision he made, he noticed as he researched Buzz Aldrin. He noticed that people who were astronauts were disciplined. They got up early. They made certain choices about their diet. And at the age of eight, he said, I am going to make decisions in my life that will not disqualify the potential of that happening. He couldn't make becoming an astronaut a possibility. In fact, Canadian Space Agency wasn't really sending many people into space at that stage, so still not today particularly. So it was a, a ridiculous, impossible dream. And he didn't say, I could make this happen. He said, I'm going to do everything in my life to not discriminate that being a possibility one day. And the yes and the no's we have over our lives, they allow us to be faithful stewards of what God has called us to be. We're stewarding our destiny. We're filtering out. We're sieving out those things that will seek to infiltrate us negatively. And fourthly and finally, who is with us on the journey? Scripture says that bad company corrupts good character. Who are we with on the journey? I find it all too easy that people, particularly when you, you love being around people, that people, people's agendas can shape your day, can't they? They can shape your life. In fact, I learned to pray many years ago on the model of the Lord's Prayer 
where Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. But I add another line into that statement. I say, not my will, not the will of other people, but your will be done. Because I find that while there are times when I need those direct words of Jesus, not my will, I need to surrender who I am to be crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I need to die daily. I need to surrender those things in my life and say, not my will, but yours be done. But I also recognize, and maybe you have the same problem as I do, that there are times when other people around will try and crowbar your agenda, will try and change what it is that God is wanting to do in your life and your day. Now, let me just step back a moment. I'm not saying that we build walls around our lives and say, I am not going to get involved in anything that I wasn't expecting to be involved in that day. It's not what I'm saying at all. But in terms of the company we keep and the people we spend time with and the people we get involved in, we are responsible for our own hearts to guard the yes and the no's. We're responsible for those things. You're responsible for those things. And you can't pass that on to anyone else. There was a, a couple that went to a, a clinical psychologist and they began to unpack the story of their 22-year-old son who was off the rails. He was partying. He was racking up debts. He was crashing cars. He was stealing money out of the home. He was doing all sorts of stuff. He never sorted his room out. He never did any stuff around the home. And just constantly the parents were bailing him out and just fixing the situations and trying to resolve circumstances that had been caused by their son. And they went to see this clinical psychologist with the burden of this, and they began to share their son's problems. And as they unloaded for about five minutes, the psychologist said to them, can I just stop you for a moment? You keep talking about your son like as if he has a problem. And they said, that's exactly why we've come to see you. But he said, everything you've told me so far would suggest to me your son doesn't have a problem. And they said, have you been listening? He said, I've been listening really well. He said, your son doesn't have a problem. They said, he does have a problem. He keeps doing this and he keeps doing that. No, he said, no, 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 no. Your son doesn't have a problem. Because every scrape he gets into, you bail him out. Every circumstance that goes wrong, you repair. Everything that doesn't go the way that it should go, you step in and restore. You are the ones with the problem. Your son hasn't got a problem. You've got the problem. And I find all too often, if we don't watch our boundaries on our lives and know our yes and our no's, we find that we all too easily blame other people for the state of our own heart. Yeah. No one encouraged me. No one did this. No one said that. And we think it's their problem, but it's our problem. It's our problem. Scripture says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who could know it? Your heart needs Jesus. I don't care how long you've been on the road serving and following the Lord. You need Jesus. You need him tomorrow morning when you get up and start your day. You need him tomorrow evening when you get engaged in the activities of the night. You need him. Amen. There's not a moment of the day you don't need Jesus. But all too often, that's other people's problems. It's yours. It's mine. And stewarding the yes and the no's of my life, psychologists said to them, you need to start letting him face some of his consequences. When he crashes the car, you don't go to the showroom and buy him a new one. Even if you can afford it, because you're not helping his problem. Right. You're taking his problem. Right. And God's plan for our lives is to develop us towards maturity. That 22-year-old hadn't put away childish things. And he needed to, because he'd only become a man when he puts away childish things. And his parents were saying, no, we're not going to let you put away childish things. We are going to let you live as a child forever. It's their problem. God wants you to mature. Maybe you're now thinking about other people who keep bailing you out. Keep rescuing you. Praise God for them in your life. But God has a bigger vision for your life. He has a vision for you to mature. To grow, yeah. to 
bless others. And it will happen as a result of you choosing the right yes and the right no. Say, this doesn't sound very Christian, Mark. This sounds like it's look after me, let everyone look after themselves. This sounds a little bit right of politics. Now, let me just give you an example of what I mean. The story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody familiar with that story? Yeah. Great story. We get all these various status people who walk past the need and they cross the road and they avoid it. And then we get the Good Samaritan. A man from another nation of the land, he comes in and he sees this need and he cares and he tends for the needs of this individual. There's a stepping outside of his world and his comfort zone. But we don't read that he cancelled all his own responsibilities to do that. In fact, we read that he took him somewhere and paid for someone to look after him while he attended to business. He didn't say, we don't read that he gave up the purpose and the call and the destiny of his life to go and meet the needs of other people. He still was a faithful steward of what God had given him. He knew his yes and his no's. You know, there are times, and this is probably more sensitive and I have time to unpack here. But there are times when you're not helping people, you're actually supporting their problem. So I don't like to say no to people. I don't, I don't like to offend them. I don't like to disappoint them. And actually, sometimes people need a no. There's a brilliant book, old book now, written by Dr. Henry Cloud called Boundaries. I encourage you to get it and read it. It's a phenomenal book that unpacks this in so many deep ways. It tells a story in the book of just how someone was being continually robbed in their life and offended by someone else, but they kept allowing them to do it because they didn't want to hurt them with a no. And he said to this person, he said, why don't you say no? You know it's what they need. You know it's what you need. Why don't you say no? This man thought about it. He said, I guess I don't want to hurt them. They're a good friend. I don't want to hurt them. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I won't put my hand up just in case it's the person next to me. <laughs> and... Um, Henry Cloud said this to them. He said, can I ask you a question? When you last went to the dentist, did he hurt you? He said, well, actually, he did. How many things do they have to stick in your mouth at the same time? Like, you know, am, I, am I a contortionist or a patient? He said, did they harm you? I thought about it. He said, no, they, they helped me. I was hurt, but I was helped. He said, there's a difference between hurt and, help and harm. He said, can I ask you another question? When somebody last gave you a sugary sweet, did it hurt you? He said, no. He said, but did it harm you? He said, yeah, probably. It's not good for me. There's a distinction between hurt and harm. Do you know I'm a mature community of God's people? Sometimes, in fact, the Proverbs puts it like this, true and faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you get offended when someone says no to you, there's a need in your life that you need to surrender to Jesus. If there is a continual sense of people walking on eggshells around you, we've got a choice. We can either wear light shoes every time we approach you and not be sincere or we can avoid you or we can say let's pick up these eggshells together and it might hurt a little bit but let's find some healing and I believe a mature community of God's people we don't avoid the tough things but we want to surrender everything that we are before the Lord. And if it temporarily 
hurts us. That we have a commitment in relationship that says we're going to, we understand the heart behind this is right and we're going to move forward and find hope and healing. See, the thing that stops this happening in today's world is the fragility and the disposability of relationships. We get offended, we move on. We get hurt, we move on. And if you do that, you will perpetuate the fundamental underlying need in your life to find healing and hope. The yes and the no's of who you hang out with. So my encouragement to you this morning is awaken your yes and your no. Prayerfully, with sincerity and authenticity, and with a desire to serve God with all of your heart. Let's pray together. In fact, can I invite you to stand as we pray? It may well be the challenge in your life of the yes and the no's. The yes and the no's of who you are, what you do, where you're going, and who you're going with. Maybe something that you know there needs to be a correction and a realignment. There needs to be a surrender. There needs to be a submission to the obedience of Christ. And I'm going to ask you gently in the presence of the Holy Spirit to invite his help. You find he's not a condemner. You find that he isn't going to come alongside you and say, finally, at last, you're letting me talk to you about this stuff. You're going to find that he will gently put his arm around you, the person of the Holy Spirit, and say, I want to help you into maturity, to grow, to give you wisdom. And right across this room, I just invite you to involve him, the person of the Holy Spirit in that conversation. I pray, not just today, not just this week, but this one shot we have at life on earth. This one moment, this one opportunity, this one alarm that sounds, that you and I will be people who spend the rest of our days saying yes in the right place to allow the right stuff into our lives and no in the right place to keep those things out of our lives. May your yes and your no's know the wisdom and the strength and the empowerment of the kingdom of God. May you know His power and resource being released and manifest in your life. May you know great courage as you make those decisions. May you know great strength and assurity of His presence as you make those tough calls. May you know the freedom and the liberation of making those decisions out of grace, not out of fear. In the name of Jesus. And just while you continue to pray, if you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus, if your life this far has been keep out, stay out, or even I'm not sure if I want Him in. And this morning you've seen people worship, you've seen people declare that their lives are God's, you've seen people that look normal just experience something of God, then this morning, You can leave this place having encountered the love and the presence of God yourself. Jesus gave His life for you. He said yes for you. He could have said no, but He said yes for you. And He calls out and says, if you call upon my name, I will save you. He says that every sin of our lives, everything we've ever done that's wrong, Jesus paid the price for that on the cross, but He requires you to say yes to Him. If you're wanting to say yes to Jesus this morning, I'm going to pray a simple prayer, and I'm going to invite you to pray this quietly in your minds after me. And the prayer goes like this. Jesus, I thank You that You love me. I'm sorry that I've not said yes before now. In fact, my life and my actions have been 
on many occasions the opposite of what I know you would want. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please wash me from all that guilt on the inside, all of that shame from my life. Wash me as you bathe me in your love and your presence. I want to say yes to you. Yes to your forgiveness. Yes to your new life. Yes to your destiny. And yes to following you all the rest of my days. In Jesus' name.